So uh, also thanks to the organizers uh, for the honor of being able to participate in this conference. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, as, as probably one of the few participants to the conference who has ever been to Albania, um, I always feel a special <laughs> affinity for Charles Taylor's famous essay, What's Wrong with Negative Liberty? We'll recall that Taylor invokes Albania's extremely few traffic lights as an example of how the absence of external impediments by itself is insufficient to establish whether I'm free or not. The quality of the actions I'm being prevented from doing, as well as their importance to my sense of self, my plan of life, my goals and intentions, are much more significant to begin with, not to mention the nature of the obstacles. In the capital of Tirana, when I was there, there were three traffic lights, and they were frequently out of order, as electricity was rather spotty at the time. So one would be free to drive unimpeded by traffic lights, as opposed to, say, downtown Manhattan. But of course, one would be restricted in other activities when Taylor wrote this essay in the 70s, such as criticizing the government, publishing one's opinions, or buying a car. Or for that matter, activities such as learning widely about the history of political thought. I went to Albania in 1993 as part of a project sponsored by the Conference of of the, for the study of political thought and funded by the International Research Exchange Board to connect with colleagues in the newly accessible countries of Eastern Europe. And Michael Mosier was also part of the group that went to Albania. We spent about two weeks there uh, running faculty seminars, including one on uh, what's wrong with negative liberty, uh, conducting pedagogy workshops, teaching classes, and holding public roundtable on the topic of tolerance, which, were featured, which was featured on television news. And of course, since Albania had only one television station at the time and not much programming, we were on TV a lot. I think, I think I will have forever imprinted on my memory that very unfortunate fuchsia blazer I wore. But as, as Michael reminded me at breakfast this morning, the other major story at the time was um, you know, Boris Yeltsin's you know, setting the tanks and bombing uh, parliament houses. So this sort of gives you a sense of, of uh, the, the, the irony of, of our little round table, table being on the news all the time. But with Charles Taylor's What's Wrong with Negative Liberty ever on my mind, of course, as it has been since I read it as a first year graduate student, I did notice the very few traffic lights in the city and relatively few cars, which was lucky for the sheep who grazed in the parks and wandered through the town. And perhaps for us, being driven around the city and the country by various Albanians um, in fierce competition with each other to be recommended by our University of Toronto colleagues, but none of whom were very good drivers, I was grateful for the absence of automobiles. But of course, the point that Taylor was making with the traffic lights was what was so potently observable. The university, still recovering from the riots that resulted in the deposing of the dictator and Hoxha, had no electricity. The windows had many broken panes, the walls were pitted, there was no functioning library, indeed there were no books. The faculty was poorly educated, the only political theory they had, had been taught was very bad Marxism. The students were eager, bright, intellectually starved. The best of them were destined to leave the country. The quality of the freedom they had in Albania before the wall came down was quite impoverished, but even after the wall came down, it was at best limited. Certainly they relished it nonetheless. Nobody, certainly not Charles Taylor, would deny that negative liberties are vital to human happiness. What they relished was the possibilities that lay ahead. As Taylor puts it in Sources of the Self, quote, the issue for us has to be not only where we are, but where we're going, end quote. And as Taylor also wisely says, negative liberty cannot make sense, it cannot flourish without positive liberty. And so upon a second trip the following year, we encountered some radical changes. The university had not only electricity, but a few computers, compliments of George Soros, to whose attention we had brought the philosophy faculty on an earlier visit. American Christian evangelicals had painted the classrooms and provided some classroom furniture. Uh, the books we had brought on our previous visit, in French and English primarily, including the idea of freedom, had been cataloged and shelved in a miniature library with plans for expansion underway as texts began to be translated into Albanian. Many of the faculty had been able to study at various universities in France and Italy and brought enhanced abilities to their classrooms, though still in need of much more improvement. So Albania was an even better illustration of positive liberty than perhaps Taylor first realized. The most important contribution of Taylor's essay, of course, was to rescue positive liberty from the two-dimensional caricatures to which it, which it was often consigned. And as he notes in that essay, most negative liberty theorists dichotomize the two models and reducing both. Uh, 
Positive liberty has collapsed into communist totalitarianism, while negative liberty retreats behind what he calls the Maginot Line mentality of defending freedom as the absence of external constraints, constraints a la Thomas Hobbes. Now, much of this, of course, is due to Berlin's original formulation itself, and he, Berlin clearly had some political motivations for his categories, wanting to align positive liberty with bad guy communist dictatorships and negative liberty with good guy Western democracies. And in this, he may have left philosophy behind for political propaganda, but if it was propaganda, it had a great deal of philosophical weight and influence. Many illustrious philosophers and political theorists today, such as George Kateb and Richard Flathman, uh, still passionately hold on to a quasi-Hobbesian uh, understanding of strict negative liberty as the only possible and plausible defense, defensible conception of freedom. But there are primarily three enhancements that positive liberty makes to negative liberty, two of which Charles Taylor overtly sees, and one of which I'm not sure that he does see, although I believe that his view of positive liberty is what makes it possible for others to see, for, for me to see. The first is that positive liberty concerns itself with the positive provision of the conditions necessary to take advantage of negative liberties, such as providing wheelchair access to buildings or scholarships for education, and it is this aspect that my Albanian experience illustrated most clearly. By obtaining new resources, the Albanians were able to improve their educations, the educations of their students, and thereby open up further options that they had not imagined before. The definition of the barriers as external impediments was too narrow, uh, as Taylor persuasively argues. For instance, freedom of education is hollow if you can't afford tuition or get into the building where instruction is offered because you use a wheelchair or if the building has no lights, no textbook, no qualified instructors. Adopting a more social notion of the self, as, as John has indicated, uh, positive liberty is able to view individual conditions as disability as well as social conditions such as poverty or an undeveloped economy or the disorientation of political upheaval as barriers to freedom that can be overcome by positive action or the provision of conditions that the individual cannot create on her own. Now, Taylor does not spend a lot of time and attention on this aspect in that article because, as he suggests, various negative liberty theorists have endorsed different versions of this idea and incorporated into their own conceptions of negative liberty. But it sets the stage for the remaining two contributions positive liberty makes. So that second contribution, the second contribution is the focus on inter internal barriers. And of course, this is the key focus of what's wrong with negative liberty. And Taylor spends a great deal of the article analyzing it. According to Taylor, we can have second order desires or desires about desires. We're all familiar with, or most of us are probably very familiar with that argument, so I'll, I'll try to summarize it very quickly. The idea is that we can if we have conflicts of desires, which are qualitatively discriminated, as he puts it, then it's not enough to experience the absence of external restraints because the immediate desires I have may frustrate my true will. Taylor most famous, famously offers the example of, quote, spiteful feelings and reactions which I almost can't inhibit are undermining a relationship which is terribly important to me. I long not to feel this spite. As long as I feel it, even control is not an option because it just builds up inside until it bursts out, end quote. There's some ellipses in there. Positive liberty theory, on Taylor's account, says that when he gives in to spite, he's not just weak-willed, but unfree, because he's violating his true desire on which he has reflected at some length. But of course, it follows from the notion of internal barriers that others may know my true will better than I, particularly when I'm in the grip of these self-destructive desires. And Taylor calls this second, the second-guessing problem, because others can claim to know what you want better than you do yourself. And of course, it's the most troubling aspect of positive liberty that people have, have criticized, a determination of the will by others, and particularly uh, problematic if it's done by the state. This was the nightmare that Berlin particularly argued against in two concepts of liberty, with good reason. But what Berlin and other negative liberty advocates seriously underplay, and what Taylor brings out so brilliantly, is the idea of an individual having conflicting desires and a divided will. Consider the smoker, smoker trying to quit, but a stressful uh, situation makes him want a cigarette. If I were to snatch the cigarette from his lips, we could argue that I am helping him realize his higher or true desire, which is to quit. Now, of course, as Taylor explains in these examples, we could argue that we don't really identify with the lower order desires, such as the smoking or the spite. So he then goes on to wrestle with conflicts where I seem to identify equally with both desires, such as uh, staying with my dying mother versus joining the French resistance. 
But even, but even addiction is, is less clear cut than we commonly imagine. I mean, if you ask any smoker, who, even one who wants to quit, she will identify the smoking as a desire that is clearly part of her. Many former smokers continue to miss, I mean, not all, but many former smokers continue to miss smoking, even though they know quitting was the wisest choice. And this actually fits with recent studies showing that addiction is not an enslavement driven by the inability to withdraw, but is rather driven by pleasure. We do the things to which we are addicted because we enjoy them, pure and simple, suggesting more autonomous control than is commonly thought. So I, I, don't want us, I don't think we should get too distracted by our assumptions about addiction and compulsion, as, as freedom theorists often are, and I think Taylor's case is even stronger. At the same time, feminist insights into the concept of difference suggest that it's problematic for political philosophers to make assumptions about what a particular subject really wants or what the reasonable person or normal person should want. For instance, even if women and men occupy opposing interest positions in contexts such as domestic violence, the implication that women is a unified category and that women thereby all want the same things is problematic. When intersected with other categories like sexuality, race, class, ethnicity, religion, and culture, it becomes quite problematic for philosophers to assume, that, to assume what individuals want or to say that what we would want is what we imagine they should want. Recent work on disability studies in particular brings out the stark failure of imagination of many political philosophers in understanding bodily difference and how such differences may introduce a range of desires completely unimaginable to others different from them. Many advocates of deaf culture, for instance, see deafness as a good, a quality that they value, in strong contrast to the dominant view that deafness is intrinsically disabling and undesirable. So standard assumptions that are made, often made about what any rational person should want often have to be called into question. And I think this is what leads to the third way that positive liberty challenges or enhances negative liberty. It's in aspects that most freedom theorists do not recognize, and I'm not sure I think including Taylor, though I think his version of positive liberty makes it possible, namely the social construction of the choosing subject of liberty, of the person who has desires and makes choices. If it's possible to say that we can have conflicting desires, and if it's possible to rank these desires as better or worse, more or less valuable, then the issue of who I am inevitably comes into play. How is it that I have the desires that I have? Why do I make the choices that I do? Such questions invite us to consider the social construction of the choosing subject, of the individual agent who has desires and makes choices within specific social, historical, and institutional contexts. The idea of social construction maintains that human beings in their world are in no sense given or natural, but are the product of historical configurations of relationships. Our desires, preferences, beliefs, values, indeed the way in which we see the world and define reality, are all shaped by the particular constellation of personal and institutional social relationships that constitute our individual and collective identities. Understanding them requires us to place them in their historical, social, and political contexts. Such contexts are what makes meaning possible and meaning makes reality. Now, I believe that a social constructivist understanding of positive liberty comes out of Taylor's insights, particularly about the internal barriers to liberty and the importance of second guessing. And yet his account of Foucault in political theory and his exchange with Bill Connolly um, suggests that he might not agree with it, um, for it doesn't cohere, I think, with Taylor's very strong and rich conception of agency. As I read him, Taylor develops a conception of the self as agent who, in order to be considered free, has to be capable of self-reflection, of judgment, of choice in a deep, meaningful sense. It is a rich and robust notion of the choosing subject, the free agent. In order to appreciate this, the importance of internal barriers to freedom has to be understood and appreciated. In his essay, What is Human Agency?, Taylor pays a great deal of attention to strong evaluation, suggesting that agency is tied with what we normally might, well, what some of us might want to call autonomy, entailing reflection and deliberation over my choices, over my desires, particularly my second order desires. But I think this somewhat runs against Taylor's conception of positive liberty, if I, unless I misunderstand. For instance, returning, returning to Taylor's spite example, he describes the feeling as emerging spontaneously from within himself, the highly individuated subject, without, the, without attending to the context within which it is developed or exists. 
Where does the spite come from? Why does he feel it? Why does he, when he says he almost can't inhibit it, what lies in that space between the almost and the can't? What is the history of this relationship, or indeed of other relationships and events in his, li his, li his life that have led him to this sort of reaction? Why does he feel spite rather than, say, withdrawal or self-pity or sadness? How does he know that this relationship is important to him or good for him? For instance, perhaps the relationship isn't really that good for him and, and not in accord with his true interests, and spite is his subconscious's way of telling him this. But it's important to note that these questions and, and the issue of internal barriers more generally constitute more than a psychological matter because such barriers are experienced within historical and social contexts and a particular framework of understanding that defines and shapes our understanding of who we are, what we want, and how our ac actions can be interpreted. Taylor gestures towards this idea by acknowledging that second guessing is, is to some degree unavoidable when we confront such situations. But in Taylor's uh, exchange with Connolly on Foucault, again, I think this is an idea he somewhat resists, though, though I think I agree with, with, with Bill that, that Taylor does himself a slight disservice here. Because this process clearly involves others' interlocution. As Taylor, as everyone knows, Taylor says in Politics of Recognition, we are formed dialogically. Hence, just as Taylor sees the relation, that the relationship is important to him and wants to stop his spiteful behavior, so we could then identify the spite as in fact protecting him from the relationship, which perhaps isn't really truly good or healthy one, as I said before. But of course, what's then to stop us from saying that such justification of spite is simply a more sophisticated way to rationalize his fear of commitment? Sorry about this. <laughs> and so on, in an endless stream of second guessing. So this isn't to reject second guessing at all. It's, it's vitally important. And I realize that Taylor's goal in this discussion is, is to get us to understand that the existence of internal barriers doesn't always automatically entail second guessing, just as it never can completely rule it out. But by not incorporating such factors into the example, he invites us to explore further what it suggests about his view of the free individual and the unspoken assumptions that law underlie that view. What social constructivism tells us is that figuring out what an individual person really wants demands a working through of history, relationship, and context, all of which requires the deep interrogation of the self and the social context in which that self is situated, as I believe Taylor recognizes. For in his view, understanding the self is a social process. It presupposes language, conceptual vocabulary, as Taylor notes, particularly in various chapters of human agency and language, as well as many other writings a system of signs with which to formulate and represent my own experience to myself, let alone to others. And it requires others with whom I can be in conversation to analyze and determine what desires are really mine and what are really better for me. But this in turn raises the question of where to draw the line between the internal self and the external world. Because our self-understandings, our desires and choices, as well as the barriers we experience always need to be understood in context. If individuals exist in context, then they, their feelings, desires, thoughts, wills, preferences, cannot be understood outside those contexts as abstract and self-contained units. Without such, such specificity of context, the individual too is unspecified and abstraction. In his rejection of the monological ideal, Taylor indicates that this influence in social embeddedness is ongoing much as I'm arguing that social constructivism requires. And he but he focuses on people we love, significant others, which I think is very consistent with its very strong conception of agency. And I think it doesn't acknowledge how impersonal a great deal of social constructivism is, how deeply subject to these forces we are, and how in the process, free agency and free will become diminished from the ideal that many of us have developed in modern political thought. Most of the others, from whom or with whom we are dialogically formed are themselves shaped and formed by others. And these others in turn are formed by still others on and on through the course of history. This, so this involves many, many people that we do not even know, do not act and, and do, and do not act, even actively encounter. Moreover, none of those people live in social vacuums but express the societies and social relations in which they live. And those relationships and societies may be oppressive, they may be liberating, they may reflect privilege or express domination, all of which in becomes incorporated into our self-understandings, our subjectivities as agents. 
And of course, many of the most important relationships that do this forming are not directly with people themselves, or even indirectly with people themselves, but through and via institutions, practices, cultures, and social structures that overwhelm and escape the intentionality of the people participating in them. These shape both us as people and the parameters of our interaction, the character of our relationships, and the possibilities for the person that I can turn into out of that. So social constructivism deploys a conception of agency that is somewhat looser and weaker than the one that Taylor develops. And this is where I wonder where about the degree to which my argument departs from his or whether he really has shown me the way to it. It employs a conception of the self that is related to, linked to, even mutually con constitutive of the other. And I, I want to note that you know, this is a part of the, par par uh, of the paper that I'm, I'm I'm feeling unconfident about, so let me just give it a shot. Because as I read him, I think that, that even given his deep attention to sociality, Taylor assumes a particular notion of the self that is re relatively self-contained. Even his account of the divided self sometimes come, comes across as rather individualistic. It implies not only that I can, but perhaps that even that I must be able to identify higher desire as mine, and I, myself, have to reject the lower desire as alien. I think there is some unavoidable logic to this, right? I mean, after all, how can I know a desire is mine unless I know it? What happens to agency if I don't know it? But I also worry that it may reduce the complexity of the case he's making so richly, um, and, and ironically, therefore, may undercut the complex, the complex view of positive liberty that he develops. For it leads to a view, I think, of the other as clearly outside the self. In Politics of Recognition, for instance, he defines the other in terms of different cultures about which we can only ever have incomplete understandings as outsiders, precisely because that is the meaning of the other, divorced from self. Now, now get me, don't get me wrong. Respect for the other is key in his work. Recognition of the other is key. Taylor says that misrecognition shows not only a lack of, quote, misrecognition shows not just a lack of due respect, it can inflict a grievous wound, end quote. And as Richard Bernstein noted yesterday, understanding the other is an important project for Taylor. My point is a little different. It's about how the other is conceptualized. And in this, I, I think that the other is fairly clearly demarcated from the self. The social constructivist variation of positive liberty allows the notion that the other is a function of the self, a product of the self, a projection of the self. This was Beauvoir's brilliant insight in The Second Sex. To say that women are other could, and to a significant extent does, mean that women are fundamentally different from men. Perhaps they're emotional to men's rational, they live in bo their bodies rather than their, their minds, and so forth. Now, feminists even before Beauvoir have argued that such dualities are false. And yet they're also true in Marx's sense of the standpoint of the proletariat. They are false in that women live in their minds just as much as men do. Men live in their bodies just as much as women do. Women deploy all kinds of rationality. Men feel all sorts of emotions. That is, such dualities do not reflect the materiality of the experiences of living women and men. Yet the ideological constructs of gender produce those very realities it claims. Men may feel emotions, but they're socialized to repress them, while women are free to express them. Just as women are taught to obsess about their bodies and their appearance in ways that men are discouraged from. This is what the, worm, the terms woman and man come to mean, at least in the West. So women are socially constructed to be the other. It is not just that women are different from men, so men have to work really hard to figure out what, you know, what, what women are like to understand them. Women are not that different, Beauvoir argues. And what men have to learn to understand is how they are forced to translate the relatively small differences between men and women in grossly exaggerated ways that become the basis for all sorts of social inequalities. Difference, Beauvoir argues, otherness, is a social product. It is something that humans create, not simply a reflection of a pre-existing reality. So perhaps in view of yesterday afternoon's discussion, it's not so much that you know, there are these walls out there that just are there innocent, you know, independently and we have to work to tear them down, so much as that we need to spend so much, to stop spending so much energy and time erecting them and shoring them up. By suggesting that people are produced through social formations and not simply limited by them, social constructivism thereby calls into question the assumption of what is genuine or true to the self and what is false, of what is self and what is other. As Kathy Ferguson puts it, 
quote, it is not simply that we are being socialized, rather a subject on whom socialization can do its work is being produced, end quote. I think someone yesterday uh, afternoon put it that we need to pay attention to the otherness within. If social construction characterizes our entire social identity and be being, if everyone is always and unavoidably socially constructed, then not only our restrictions, but our powers as well must have been produced by this very same process. Who we are, the choosing subject, exists within and is formed by particular contexts. The contexts in which we live produce our agency. Yet while they make our agency possible, they often simultaneously put restraints on our freedom. This duality of social construction permits, even requires, a more complicated engagement. For indeed, social construction suggests that the dichotomy between negative and positive liberty, between internal and external restraint, is itself a construction, and we must see the self as socially constituted in this very deep way. Social constructivism thus adds an important dimension to positive liberty by showing us that a focus on external barriers will be weakened without recognition to the internal, as well as the larger social, institutional, and cultural context in which such barriers are created and operate. And I think this is what Taylor's argument shows us as well, the inherently social dimension of internal barriers, not just external conditions, but the internal barriers and the relationship between internality and externality. In other words, I'm saying that it's Taylor's argument that I think makes this insight possible, at least as I read him. I believe Taylor's positive liberty leads us to the insight that we must acknowledge the interaction of inner and outer, to see them as interdependent in meaning and practice, in order to interrogate the social construction of the choosing subject. This interaction does not result in determinism, the view that uh, since there's no way not to be socially constructed, you know, there's no way to change ourselves because humans can't control these large social formations. Rather, it provides the means for identifying not only the ways in which power relations are structured, but also why it's so difficult uh, to see those relations and that structure. So, in my view, uh, the possibilities of social construction and the focus on the internal aspects of will, desire, will, identity, and how they both facilitate and block freedom, is the most important contribution of Taylor's reconstruction of Berlin's typology. You know, Ta Charles Taylor has written so many wonderful, eloquent books, uh, much grander in scope uh, than this article, um, though they address uh, many of the issues that uh, were raised in the article. And I'm happy, de been delighted to sit and listen to others expound on the virtues of these other grand, these other grand, important, even momentous works. Uh, but for me, this article is the most important thing he ever did. It shaped my intellectual and professional life charting a path for me throughout my career. So I want to thank you very much for writing it and for all of your wonderful contributions to political philosophy. Thank you.